Hello friends, welcome back. Now, the internet is an amazing place. We can use it to learn all sorts of new skills. We can use it to learn how to speak a language or how to tile our bathroom or how to do whatever it is this guy is doing here. And that reminds me actually, when this video is done, I've got to give the wife a quick bell. But we also know by now that hidden inside all that useful information is a huge steaming dog turd of misinformation. Now, some of this misinformation really is harmless, if not a little amusing. Mass is identical to weight, but this mass, this weight is space weight. And unfortunately, just as some people have tragically learned over the last couple of years, some of that misinformation is extremely harmful. But fortunately for us, it's quite often easy to spot misinformation on the internet as those people peddling it usually have maybe a Flat Earth logo on their YouTube channel, or maybe they mirror videos from David Icke, or maybe they're from Burnley. Now I truly believe that misinformation must be stomped on as soon as we find it to prevent gullible people from listening to that information and regurgitating nonsense like this. Could clouds be made of salt? But what happens when that scientific misinformation is harder to spot? What happens when scientific misinformation comes, for example, out of one of the world's most prestigious universities? And what if that scientific misinformation lay in the field of cutting edge cancer research? And what if this problem didn't seem to be a one-off, but a problem that's been happening over years, affecting literally dozens of peer-reviewed scientific published papers? Now that would be much harder to spot and far less funny than this. If you were travelling from Scotland down to, uh, to London on a ball, it would be downhill all the way. You wouldn't need to put any petrol in your car. You'd just use your brakes. So ladies and gentlemen, strap in, strap on, hold on tight as I walk you through the most recent scandal that is unveiling right now over at Harvard University involving potential data fraud in their cancer research. Now, our story actually starts here with a paper that was published in May of 2022. It's got a really catchy title, Target Receptor Identification and Subsequent Treatment of Resected Brain Tumours with Encapsulated and Engineered Allergenic Stem Cells. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And if you were to Google that paper yourself, you'll see here an editor's note, which was left on the 2nd of February this year, alerting readers that there are concerns about the reliability of the data in this paper. Now that is a real shame because when we look at the abstract of this paper, it sounds so promising. It's a paper that is researching how to treat geoblastoma, which is a type of brain cancer, and the survival rates for GBM are actually quite low. They talk about some sort of off-the-shelf treatment. It's a hydrogel that contains stem cells which target DR receptors on the cancer cells that will cause the cancer cells basically to die. Now in this paper, they say they've had great success in treating tumors taken from mice. And when they compare the receptors on the GBM cells taken from mice, they are very, very similar to those in humans. And therefore some kind of clinical trial involving humans could be just around the corner. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that this scientific paper written by people from Harvard Medical School is gonna offer a lot of people a lot of hope. And the only thing that might put a slight dampener on it, to say the least, is if when we get to the results section of the paper here, we find out that some of these images, which are meant to be results from this study, actually turn out to be images that have just been copied and pasted from other papers and even an online shop. But that won't happen, will it? Anyway, let's jump straight to the results section and see if we can't figure out what's been going on, shall we? When we scroll down the results section, we are greeted to this lovely set of images here. And we are going to be focusing on this group of images, which is figure 1E, and this group of images here, which is figure 1F. And if we flip back to the paper, we can see exactly what these images are. They are both taken from tumour blocks, GBM tumour blocks. In other words, for figure 1E, somebody has taken a human patient, they've taken a geoblastoma tumour, it has been sliced and diced so we can look at it under the microscope, and for figure 1F, they've also done that for mice that have geoblastoma tumours. And the idea, remember, is that we're comparing the nature of and the location and the distribution of these uh, receptors over those cells, and we're looking for some kind of correlation which might lead us to believe that this wonder treatment will not just be wonder treatment for mice, but will also be a wonder treatment for humans as well. So it's very, very important that these images obviously are correct. 
Anyway, on a completely unrelated note, let's look at this paper from 2010. This paper is an excellent paper and it also has some lovely images. And as I scroll down these images, I'm going to stumble across all oh, this lovely selection of tissue block images here. And if I look at the one in the middle on the bottom, it does seem to be a little bit familiar. In fact, I think it looks like the one from our 2022 paper that's second from the left on the first row. Now there's only one way really to find out and that is to maybe snap both of those uh, images and maybe put them side by side. Now I know these appear a little bit blurry, however do bear with me. Uh, if we were to mark out some of the significant features on each of those images, it does appear that they do have a remarkable number of significant features in common. And I'm struggling to find any differences at all. And if I was maybe to delete uh, each of these images and see what happens if I do this, try not to be too blown away by my PowerPoint skills, then I think you'll agree that those results are kind of interesting. Given the fact that figure 1e e is from a paper from 2022, how can they be including results from a paper that was written 10 years earlier without crediting or acknowledging said paper um, in the references or the acknowledgement section, which, which this paper in 2022 doesn't. Now, let me just put my cards on the table here. It might be that it's perfectly okay for this 2022 paper to use this historic tissue block because maybe it's just a good quality tissue block and it's nice and easy for them to get the data they want from it. Maybe that's perfectly fine. But the problem I have with believing that, although it might be true, but the problem I personally have with believing that is underneath figure one, it tells us that figure one E is photomicrographs from a tumor block from a GBM tumor. However, when we look at the paper in which this image was used 12 years ago or 14 years ago now, and we look at the title, this is about a completely different type of cancer. And in fact, you can look up this paper and you can do a keyword search for geoblastoma or GBM and you won't find it anywhere in the paper. So I find that extremely curious, but it doesn't stop there. You see, if we scroll down a little bit further, we're gonna find another lovely bunch of images. Let's stop here, for example. And those of you with a photographic memory might recognize this image that I'm hovering over here. And you might recognize it as being this image here, the third one down from the middle uh, in figure 1e. Now, surely this couldn't have happened twice. Well, let's take that image uh, and have a look, shall we? These are the two images we are talking about. Uh, and again, this one on the left comes from a paper that doesn't mention geoblastoma or GBM whatsoever. And these ones on the right, as we can see, clearly labeled are tumor blocks that are derived from GBM cell lines. Quite the curiosity. And when we look at both of these images, again, we can mark out a whole host of similarities. And the relative locations of these similarities, again, make for a very, very interesting read. I'm sure you'll agree. Now, of course, this may be a genuine mix-up. There may be a scientific reason that's too high level at the minute for me to understand as to why we can take uh, tissue blocks and label them as GBM tissue blocks, when in fact, it appears, at least on the surface, that they are not GBM tissue blocks. There may be a reason we can put them in a paper without acknowledging that we've taken them from another paper. They, there may be reasons far above my level of understanding. As for this next example, I'm sure there's a perfectly good reason, but I'm going to need you perhaps to suggest that in the comments because I'm not too sure myself what that might be. If we have a look at figure 1f, now remember figure 1f, these are the GBM tumor blocks taken from mice. And I've put a little ring uh, or square around this image here. And what we will find is if we take a really strong look at that image, we can also find that somewhere else on the internet. And we can find it in this online shop here for people who essentially sell antigens and quite a reasonable price as well, I would assume. Uh, and if we were to take a clip of both images side by side, we can see again that they do appear to be the same image. So I am a little bit lost, but somebody who might be able to help us out is my new hero. So meet Elizabeth Bick, who's fast becoming a bit of a hero of mine. You can follow her on Twitter here at 
at Microbiome Digest, and you can follow her on her blog here, the Science Integrity Digest. Now, not so long ago, Elizabeth Bick was given an anonymous tip-off about some shoddy workmanship that was going on in the research over at Harvard Medical School. So she put her investigative skills to the test and used an online image searching software to locate the anomalies that we've looked at in this video. But not only did she locate those three images we've just looked at, she found far, far more than that. And it's all well worth uh, looking up in her blog here. Now, as for which of the authors is responsible for these uh, anomalies, should we say, it's impossible for me to know that. There's nearly 30 authors on this paper, and I have no idea which author um, contributed to which part of the paper, and I'm not going to point fingers. But what I can say is, based on the back of Elizabeth's big work, the Harvard Crimson did post this article here. And this article does name Khalid Shah. Now, Khalid Shah is one of the authors of this paper. And he seems to be an extremely well-respected uh, individual. He's a professor at Harvard Medical School, and he's the principal faculty at Harvard Stem Cell Institute in Boston. He's got a very, very long and prestigious academic record. However, Bick does allege that there are 44 instances of data falsification in papers in which uh, Shah's name are attached, spanning over 22 years. Now, just to be clear one last time, just because Shah's name is mentioned uh, in this article and it's linked to these papers doesn't mean that he had anything to do with those images. It could be people that he regularly works with. I don't know. At this point, I'm not naming any names whatsoever other than showing you what's on this article, but I will be following this story and updating you as it progresses. And also, I'll be bringing you this story here, um, which I was shocked to see while I was researching uh, the content for today's video. Only last month, six scientific papers were retracted and a further <clears throat> 31 were corrected for more data falsification allegations at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute. I had no idea that this kind of practice was, was rife in the scientific world. And the fact that it seems to be rife in cancer research really, really does make me feel quite sick. Uh, so I think I'm going to be spending a little bit of time on this topic and hopefully in the next video I can bring you a lot more information on, uh, on this whole topic. I will see you soon.